Recent years have seen many improvements in women's career progress. For example, the representation of women on boards of large quoted companies increased from 12% in 2012 to 29% in 2020. The Me Too campaign has drawn attention to sexism in the workplace and has decreased sexual harassment against women. As a Finn, I can especially proudly note the increasing presence of women in politics. For example, in Finland, in the 21st century, roughly 50% of all ministers have been women. And currently, Sanna Marin is leading the government as a prime minister. Despite these positive developments, a lot remains to be done in terms of gender equality. We know that women encounter glass ceiling relatively early on in their career development and that they remain underrepresented in top decision-making positions, and that a significant gender wage gap persists all around the world. What is more, segregation between men's and women's jobs and fields is very strong in many countries. For example, in Finland, many technological fields and finance remain very male-dominated. Worryingly, the overall progress towards ending the gender economic participation and opportunity gap is slowing down. According to a recent report by the World Economic Forum, at the current pace, it will take up to 257 years to close the gap. We know from existing research that networking is crucial for career progress, as it facilitates access to critical resources, such as advice, technical knowledge, strategic insights, or simply emotional support. Unfortunately, there's also evidence that women's networks are smaller than those of men and that they have less influential and powerful contacts in their networks. Therefore, it's not a surprise that networking also offers less utility for women. Why is this? In our research that I conducted with my two wonderful colleagues, we wanted to develop an in-depth understanding of how women approach networking and why they are less comfortable than men to strategically build and leverage networks for the purposes of their career development. The results of our study revealed two complementary sets of reasons that help explain the lower scope and level of utility of women's networks. The first set of reasons confirms that structural exclusion arising from work-family conflict and homophily make it difficult for women to enter and access different networks in the first place. So the gender imbalance in career and enhancing networking activities is partially attributable to women having no time or not wanting to spend time in networking, especially after working hours because of various home-related responsibilities. At the same time, homophily, similarity, love of the same, unites men and the women who could potentially join remain or feel excluded from the informal social circles of powerful males. Consequently, women are disadvantaged when it comes to accessing and building networks. Such st structural exclusion consisting of work-family conflict and homophily is what we consider as an external reason in the sense that it is difficult for women to change it on their own, yet, this, yet it significantly influences the structure of their networks. The second set of reasons concerns women's personal hesitation to instrumentalize their social ties, eventually resulting in lower levels of perceived utility or added value from networking. Ultimately, networking is about reciprocal relations and an exchange of benefits. We found that women's hesitation to participate in such exchange um, of giving and taking builds on two main drivers, relational morality and gendered modesty. These drivers are more internal in contrast to structural exclusion and capture how women frame and think about networking. Specifically, what we mean with the relational morality is that women are very careful to avoid the feeling of over-benefiting while networking. That is, they have a difficulty in taking and they often maintain this uneasy feeling of being in debt. In a way, women consider networks in moral terms and in social terms and emphasize how a utilitarian approach seems foreign to them. At the same time, women are hindered by what we call gendered modesty, which describes how women underestimate their own value 
and what they have to offer for their networks. As they don't believe they have something to contribute, it's quite natural to hesitate engaging in networking. Interestingly, similar dynamics have been observed in how women negotiate, and they also underline the so-called imposter syndrome, whereby an individual consistently doubts her skills, talents and accomplishments, and fears to be discovered as a fake, without any real reason. To sum up these findings, our analysis confirms the existence of structural exclusion in terms of work-family conflict and homophily that limit women's network form formation and undermine their motivation to engage in networking in the first place. Once women network, personal hesitation steps on their way, as they are careful not to over-benefit and they emphasize the moral aspects of reciprocity. In addition, women underestimate their potential contribution in a professional context and remain too modest. All this makes it difficult for women to participate in the give and take of networking. In another research project, we have shifted our focus on women-only networking events to investigate whether women-only networking allow women to benefit from homophily, this love of the same, in a similar way like men do. In other words, we asked the question, could women-only networking remove the structural barrier of homophily, or rather, could it create a parallel homophilic structure that advances women's careers? Unfortunately, our results indicate that this is not the case, or at least that the matter is not so straightforward. Rather, our findings suggest that women in different career stages approach networking with very different expectations and objectives and consequently also behave very differently in networking situations. Younger women join events to have fun and they don't necessarily perceive gender as such as a big issue for career development. The most experienced women have made it to the top and have typically overcome many challenges by playing the game with men's rules. As such, their need to connect with women at lower levels of hierarchy is less. Women in the mid-phases of their career have typically very crowded lives, they're very focused and driven, and they know that the race to the top is tough. Their approach to networking is more instrumental. Therefore, despite the good intentions to create a shared feeling of sisterhood and to compensate for being isolated from powerful male networks, gender seems to cease to be the uniting factor in many women-only networking events. However, we should not dismiss women-only networking as pinkwashing, but rather think carefully how we organize it. Namely, in our research, we also observed that when the purpose and the goals of net the networking events are beyond career considerations and planned such that interdependencies between the participating women can develop, women-only networking can also generate useful connections and foster women women's careers. What remains sure is that gender risk discrimination hurts the women in question and that organizations miss a lot of talent uh, by not including women. Not forgetting that not having the full female participation in the labor force is economically harmful. Most importantly, gender diversity and equal opportunities are issues of business ethics, responsible leadership and organizational justice. With our work, we hope to encourage every one of us to include a seat at the table for the female colleague in our network. And if there is no seat for a woman, she should not hesitate and think twice about bringing one for herself. I thank you for your attention and I would be very happy to continue this discussion with you.